Sim, Rafael, I'd like to apologize for the classes of today because in the beginning, the proposal of the school was to have another classes today. Uh, we invited Professor Marcus Muller from Germany to be here, but due to health problems with he, his partner, he couldn't come here. So he informed us more than one month ago, but we tried to find, find out another professor to give a lecture, mini course for you. But of course, it was not easy. So unfortunately, we could find someone to be here in, in the place of Professor Marcus Mulder. Okay? Uh, but today we have the talk by Professor Rafael Chaves. And right after, we have time for discussion, exercise. Of course, please do the exercise. We are not asking you to give you was the solutions of the exercise, but of course, to learn to the, the things we are receiving here. Of course, we must do all of them. Read the documents Professor Duzioni, Professor Marx gave you. We have the, all the talks, all the lectures on the website, <coughs> so you can see, you can I uh, study again. So please go to the website and take all the information you need to do the exercise. Well, today we have the opportunity to, to be here with Rafael Chaves. Rafael Chaves uh, got his uh, bachelor in Federal University of Minas Gerais. He's from Rio de Janeiro, but he did his bachelor there. Then, right after, he got the master in Rio de Janeiro, in CBPF, the Centro Brasileiro de Pesquisas Físicas. Uh, who was your advisor there? Uh, Sebastião Alves Dias. He's uh, uh, high energy physics. High energy physics. So then he got his PhD in Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Luiz Davidovich. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With Professor Luiz Davidovich, Davidovich or Davidovich. What is the right pronunciation? I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Then he did postdocs in Spain in the Institute of Photonics of Science in Barcelona. I guess Barbara is from there. Uh, then another postdoc in Freiburg University in Germany. Another postdoc in Germany again in Cologne. And now he's professor at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte and a researcher in the International Institute of Physics in Natal. Uh, he has a lot of experience in quantum information, quantum computation, open systems and decoherence, in thermodynamic theory, non-locality, and mainly foundations of aspects of quantum mechanics. So I guess the most important guy in Brazil to discuss foundations of quantum mechanics Probably it's Rafael. It's a pleasure to, to have you here with us. So the time is yours. Take your time to talk as much as you want. OK, thanks, Celso. I'm well aware that I'm the only person between you and the weekends, so I will not uh, talk that much, OK? Don't, don't worry. Um, yeah, so thanks, Celso, and the other organizers. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it has been a long and intense, but also very uh, productive week. Okay, so uh, my main field is quantum information and uh, foundations, causing fear, and so I'm a bit out of my expertise here. Um, so if you have any questions, ask uh, Askeri. Uh, he's the expert on machine learning. So, I mean, just to tell you a story, like uh, some years ago when Askeri joined the uh, institute as a visiting uh, professor, so he knew a lot about uh, uh, machine learning, and back then we had a few problems that we didn't know how to solve. It was very hard to solve them, and then we said, well, okay, let's try to use machine learning. Uh, it was kind of exploding back then, 2017, 2018, and it turned out that it worked. So that's the kind of story that I'm going to uh, be telling you here. Um, I don't work in the, like, uh, creating new algorithms or anything like that. What I, I use classical and quantum machine learning as a tool. So what I'm going to tell you here today is like a, my personal story of how to use these tools in a kind of problems that I'm interested. Okay. Um, and by the way, if you have any questions, uh, please interrupt me at any time. Okay. I realize that there are many people uh, out from outside 
Brazil, so let me just take like a 30 seconds here to present where I come from. It's Natal, that it's in the northeast of uh, Brazil. The state is Rio Grande do Norte. Uh, it's not a very famous place, but it's actually the closest uh, city in South America to Europe. So like from Natal to uh, Lisbon, it's six, six and a half hours. It's very easy to, to go to Europe. What's very good, meaning that we have a lot of people coming to our institute. I mean, the last four years, it was complicated for reasons that uh, you know why. Not only the pandemic, but um, yeah, so it's a quite beautiful place. Here's just some of the uh, landscapes you would see there. I actually live very near this beach here, so I'm very happy. Um, this is our institute. Uh, its mission and scope, it's very similar to uh, ICTP. Uh, in a sense, like we have very few uh, permanent uh, people, uh, faculty, but a lot of like uh, visitors. So uh, a lot of uh, events. So of course, you are very uh, welcome to come to visit us. This is the main auditorium. Like this is my uh, supervisor, Luis. He has been there a uh, few times. Okay, so uh, just before starting, just to say that like uh, outreach is very important for us there. So let me just take the opportunity to uh, um, advertise a few of the things we do there. So we have this uh, podcast, it's in Portuguese, but it's actually, I mean, for people that speak Portuguese or Spanish, I think it's quite, we interview like a lot of uh, researchers about their careers. So I think uh, especially for students to know how is to, like what's the career of a uh, physicist, it's quite interesting. So this is the, uh, our uh, web page and the uh, Twitter of our group. The Instagram of the Institute, it's quite, uh, we create a lot of uh, content. So in Folha de São Paulo, like uh, not only me, but like many other people are writing articles. I mostly uh, write about quantum information and foundations. There are two new texts uh, coming soon. One is about uh, quantum winter. So I will not tell you if I think it's coming or not. You, you should uh, read the text in a, in a few weeks. So uh, we Fasqueri and Leandro Aulita, who is in Abu Dhabi now, we have this uh, startup that was mentioned here. So I mean, uh, it's on hold now, but if you have any business idea, you can get into contact with us. And here, like many people asked me like, uh, about this book, so uh, this is the title. It was, um, uh, it started selling like one month ago. So it's in Amazon and all these, uh, uh, sites that sell books. So it's in Portuguese, like people that are entering the field now, I think it could be, uh, I mean, I tell this, the history of uh, quantum mechanics, like quantum information and give all the concepts. So actually I learned a lot of like uh, very interesting stories to, to write this book. So it's, uh, I mean, probably soon it's going to be in these uh, Russian sites for free, be it my guest. If you, if you don't spend any money, it's, it's fine. Um, yeah, so that's it. Now, uh, what is this talk about? So what's machine learning? This is like the bird's eye view. I'm not going to end, I mean, I don't know much more than that actually, but uh, the idea is that uh, in, uh, in traditional um, um, algorithms, like what we want is like to make a prediction, right? And for that, we need data. We need like a handcrafted model, like some equations or whatever. We put this in into a computer that's going to crunch the numbers and give us some uh, results. So like, for example, this data could be the position, the, the velocity of some uh, planet. Then we have like some uh, equations of motion. We put that in the computer, it's going to give us some prediction. So this is the usual uh, framework. And what is machine learning? Well, there are many different uh, frameworks for uh, machine learning. Here's like the, perhaps the simplest to explain that it's uh, supervised learning. So now we have data, we have some sample data. We don't have a model anymore. This is actually what we would like to get. So like in supervised learning, we have some uh, data, some input data, uh, together with what would be the results. So you can think of like, okay, I'm giving some uh, positions and ve uh, velocities and the mass of the planets or whatever. I'm giving what is the expected uh, position of these planets like in a few instants of time. And I'm asking now the computer to create a model, like give me hopefully some equations that is going to describe 
uh, this input data that I'm giving. And now, with a model, I'm back to the usual uh, setup, if you wish, where now I can get new data that the computer has, has never seen before. And using this model that was created by the own machine, I can get the uh, results for the new instances, okay? So, so that's the uh, basic idea. And what is quantum machine learning? Well, uh, it's the same idea. So this is the typical uh, picture that we see when we talk about quantum machine learning. It's the same idea, but now we have uh, the possibility of two new features. One of those is, uh, so now we basically uh, classify the type of data we have and the type of algorithm. So CC would be classical classical, the usual uh, machine learning. Now we can also have a classical algorithm, like something that we are going to run in our usual uh, computers, but the data could be quantum. And what means the data to be quantum? It could mean that actually like, uh, I mean, uh, I have some quantum state, like uh, the uh, a particle described by a wave function, or it could be that I actually have classical data that encodes properties of this quantum system. So it could be like the, uh, the, uh, the amplitudes of a given uh, quantum state, it could be like the uh, tomography of a given experiment. And now uh, we have different ways to uh, process that, like we can process these uh, data classically, or we can process that using uh, quantum algorithms. So like in principle, these quantum algorithms would need a quantum device, a quantum computer to run, or of course we can still use this idea of quantum algorithms, but run them into a classical computer. This is what most people are doing because quantum computers don't exist yet, so we are still like at this stage where we are looking for proof of principle. So that's the uh, overview. And now my idea is to describe two uh, problems that we are interested and in, how we solve them or how we approach them using uh, classical and quantum machine learning. Okay, so I will describe the problem and then our solution with uh, ML. Okay, so the first one is the characterization of quantum causal uh, networks. And so this is a fancy name, but in the end of the day, like it's very important, like one very particular case of that is, is the simplest instance of what uh, we call a quantum network got the Nobel Prize this year. So. Uh, I'm sure you all heard of that. So the uh, Nobel Prize for the violation of a Bell inequality. So what is a Bell inequality? It's something that we use to characterize causal networks. So I'm going to describe uh, very briefly like uh, this is a simple case of Bell's theorem and then expand to talk about uh, really complicated uh, generalizations of it and how we can use uh, machine learning to uh, characterize this complicated networks. Okay, so uh, I will not spend much time here because uh, there are many talks now in the internet, like for sure you've, uh, even if you have never seen before this now, I'm sure that in the last weeks you heard a lot about Bell's theorem, so, sure? Any question? No. Okay. Um, okay, so here it's my personal view of uh, Bell's theorem. We have uh, two distant uh, parties, like uh, we have Alice and Bob in distant uh, labs. There is some source of uh, systems here, could be ping pong balls or uh, entangled uh, photons. They are shared between these two distant labs and in each uh, round of the experiment, Alice and Bob, that are the observers, they have the freedom to choose uh, in, in, this, uh, simplest, in this simplest case, two possible observables to measure. So like uh, if it's a photon or if it's some light, Alice could be using like a red or a blue filter and the same for Bob. And of course, like we are going to describe this by some observables. And the point here is that, uh, so what's behind Bell's uh, theorem? Is that we are imposing a given causal network to the experiment. We are imposing a causal structure to the experiment. And in the end of the day, what we want to know is if uh, some classical model, some classical causal model can explain or not the data that we have, the data that we get out of the experiment. So we are going to talk a bit more about these uh, kind of graphs here, but they are very uh, intuitive. So like basically, X is the choice of Alice to measure uh, red or blue, Y is the same for Bob, A and B are the uh, results of the measurements that they perform, like if the light bulb uh, clicks or not, if the photon uh, detector clicks or not. 
And we have this variable here, uh, lambda, that accounts for all uh, possible degrees of freedom of the source, okay? Um, and of course, like when we talk about Bell's uh, theorem, we want to know if there is a random variable that describes the uh, properties of the system, even when they are not measured. So here, it's centering this uh, hypothesis of uh, realism of uh, Einstein. Okay, so we are talking about quantum mechanical experiment. Everything that quantum mechanics allow us to predict, it's the probabilities of a given experiment. And the, in this particular experiment, is the probability that we get some outcomes A and B, given that Alice and Bob decided to measure X and Y. Okay, so apart from this hypothesis of uh, realism, that it's this uh, classicality, the assumption that we have this uh, hidden variable that describes the uh, possible uh, results of the experiment, there is actually two causal assumptions that enter here. So the assumption that Alice and Bob, they can decide what to, uh, what to measure independently of how the system has been uh, prepared. So basically uh, stating that this uh, probability distribution should factorize and the locality assumption, because these two labs are very distant, uh, whatever Alice is doing in her lab should not affect the statistics of what Bob is observing, okay? And the point, as you all know by now, is that these three assumptions, they imply uh, constraints to what we can observe in a given experiment. Like one of these famous uh, constraints, it's the Sage Sage inequality, the Clauser, Horn, Shimon, and Holt. Clauser is one of the guys who won the uh, Nobel Prize. And among other things, these inequality is why he got the uh, Nobel Prize. I mean, I'm not going to enter in details, but this inequality was historically very important. Okay, so this uh, conjunction of these three assumptions, the realism one and these two causal assumptions, they imply uh, this uh, inequality. And with quantum mechanics, like if instead of having ping pong balls here, we have uh, entangled photons or whatever it's entangled, we can surpass this classical bound of two and reach two square root of two, okay? So this is what most people did for, uh, so Bell is 64, yeah, so it's what most people did for 50, 60 years. But recently, it has been realized that uh, Bell's theorem, it's actually, it's actually the tip of the iceberg. So, yeah? Well, so these are just uh, expectation values. It's what we can measure like in an experiment, right? So uh, A0, B0. This would be the product of the outcomes of Alice and Bob, given that they decided to measure like X equal to zero and Y equal to zero. So they are using the uh, red filters, if you wish. So like what you have to do in this experiment is that each time Alice and Bob, they have to decide randomly which property they want to measure x equal to zero, like it's some polarization, it's some filter, x equal to one, it's some different polarization or filter. And each time they have to randomly decide which of these terms to measure, and in the end they just make the average and compute whether they violate this bound or not. It's, it's described by this uh, variable X and Y here. It's like a coin, it's a classic coin that they flip each time they, so like uh, there is a source that it's uh, producing uh, photons. Every time a photon arrives in your uh, lab, you have to, you flip a coin and you decide if you want to measure the polarization of this photon along the vertical or diagonal direction. So it's, uh, it's uh, we call this like the input or the uh, measurement cho choice. Okay, so please interrupt me. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, not sure I'm really ex extrapolating here, but basically any experiment, what we do, like if you really think in a very general uh, sense, what we are doing is that we are imposing a causal structure to the experiment. This is like, uh, whenever we do uh, an experiment, this is what we are doing. Like we are forcing our experiment to have some underlying causal structure. Like uh, let's say uh, A is going to affect B, B is going to affect C. So like we might have a temporal order or we have something like in Bell 
where uh, Alice and Bob, they are too far away to have di uh, direct influences one over the other, so the correlations might be mediated by uh, this hidden variable lambda. So basically, any experiment, it's, uh, the, the first step, it's like to impose a given causal structure to our experiment. And from a very broad uh, perspective, we can understand then Bell's theorem as this. We are imposing a given causal structure to my experiment. And now what I want to know is whether a classical explanation of this experiment is possible or not. And now we can go beyond this causal structure, this very simple uh, causal structure of Bell, and think of um, networks of increasing uh, complexity, number of nodes, and uh, topologies. So how we represent these uh, uh, causal structures. So we use this directed acyclic uh, graphs. That's basically a graph uh, where each node is a variable of uh, uh, relevance to the, to the experiment. And these arrows, they basically encode the, um, the causal relations between these variables. So to understand what this means, we say that the causal relationships, they are encoded in the conditional independences that are implied by the DAG. So what this means? Let's look to this uh, simple uh, DAG here, to this uh, causal structure. Lambda 1 and lambda 2, they do not have an arrow from one to the other. Neither there is a third node, uh, let's say lambda 3, that connects both these variables. So this means that these two variables should be causally independent. And statistically, this means that whatever is the process that uh, governs these two variables, the probability of them should factorize, because they are uh, causally independent. Now, let's look at A and B. They do have a common cause. So in general, A and B, they are going to be correlated. Their uh, probability distribution does not factorize. But all the correlations between them are mediated by lambda 1. So if I condition on lambda 1, then the correlations, they are screened off. They, are, they disappear. So what this means is that uh, the correlations between A and B, they are mediated by this variable lambda 1. And the point here, this is just like uh, an example, is that conditional independences, they hold information about uh, uh, causation. So this is a story of uh, statistics, that uh, co uh, correlation does not imply causation. This is the, wo the worst and uh, wrongest uh, sentence in science. It does. So if there is anything you, you can take from this talk is this, is that indeed we can talk about uh, causation from correlations. Okay, so now the question is uh, how we can, given some, so let's say I, I have a, an experiment, I'm going to get data out of it, and I want to know if some uh, conjecture, if some hypo, hypothetical uh, causal structure is compatible with my data or not. So how can I do that? So let's say that I, I have some experiment with these uh, six variables, and for some reason, I believe that the causal relations between the variables, it's something like this. How can I test that experimentally, empirically? Well, basically, I need to get the probability distribution of all these variables and check whether the uh, conditional independences implied by this causal structure, and these are only two, but we have many here, and we have algorithms that are very efficient to list what are the conditioning independences that hold for a certain uh, causal structure. Now I have the data, and everything I have to check is if these uh, conditions implied by my causal structure are, sat are satisfied or not. If one of them is not satisfied, I have proved experimentally that uh, my hypothesis is uh, wrong. I've just proven that no, whatever is the underlying causal structure, it, it could not be this one. So if we have access to the full uh, probability distribution in a given experiment, basically checking these uh, conditional independences, we can solve this uh, very fundamental problem. The problem is that for a variety of uh, reasons, we do not have access to the full probability distribution that uh, describes a given experiment. So like in the, ca in the case of Bell, by, hypo by uh, hypothesis, we treat this source here as, um, as a hidden variable, like something that we might not have access, like full empirical access to. And this is a problem, uh, why? Because if you just look at the conditional independences that are implied by this model here, you see that uh, all the conditional independences, they involve explicitly the variable lambda. But if I don't have access to lambda, how can I check these uh, conditions? I can't. 
So that's the basic idea behind Bell's uh, uh, theorem, that I do have conditions on the level of things that I don't have empirical access to, but they have consequences this, uh, to the, uh, they do have consequences to what I can observe in a given experiment. So like, I can just take these uh, things that I cannot test uh, directly, but they have consequences to what I can observe, that in, in this case it's P of AB given X, X and Y. And this uh, translation to what I cannot, to what I can observe, gives us exactly Bell inequalities. So Bell inequalities are simply um, observable consequences of uh, an underlying causal structure, okay? So we can think of like uh, these Bell inequalities. So everything that is compatible with a certain uh, causal model is going to define a set. The set can be convex, can be non-convex. We are going to, to discuss that a, a bit more. But basically Bell inequalities are the boundaries of these uh, sets, okay? So, and now uh, we have the set of quantum uh, correlations that include what we call the uh, classical set, the uh, local set. And now, if I generate a given point in uh, the experiment that it's quantum, you see that it ho it's outside the local set. And a point here in this uh, um, purple region then is going to violate a given Bell inequality. And I can even uh, define like uh, larger sets that include the quantum set. Uh, for example, the set of uh, correlations that are compatible with, with special uh, relativity. Of, of course, quantum correlations are compatible with special uh, relativity, but we have a larger set. So it's this uh, green region here, it's what we would call like the set of post-quantum correlations. Okay, so that's the basic problem. I do some experiment and I want to know if it's compatible with a given causal model or not, but I cannot test the conditional independences directly, so I have to test what are the consequences of those, and these are these Bell inequalities. Okay, so this uh, kind of set here, that it's convex, it's uh, well behaved, it's what people have done for the last uh, 50 years. But now, if we go to this new sort of uh, causal structures, where we have more complicated uh, topologies, and in particular, the sources of uh, correlations, they are independent among them. This is a very hard problem, because now we have a non-convex set, something like this, so uh, what means to be convex? It means that uh, any two points inside a given convex set, it's, it's still inside the convex set. So if I just sum this point here with some weight, and a point here with some weight, obviously it's going to be somewhere in the middle. So this is the idea of uh, convexity. But now, in this case, I have a non-convex set. I can uh, take a point that it's inside this set here, sum it with another point that it's here, and now I'm outside the set. And characterizing such non-convex sets, it's extremely uh, difficult. So in general, we need algebraic uh, geometry uh, methods, and even the best known algorithm is double e exponential. So, this means that even for very simple causal structures, like with six variables, this is totally out of reach. Like we cannot do anything to uh, characterize what are the Bell inequalities, this nonlinear, this uh, polynomial Bell inequalities that uh, describes these uh, non-convex sets. Yeah. Sorry. The pure. Um, so, where here, here, I mean, we have many external points. Yeah, so uh, in, the ca in the case of the classical set, yeah. these extreme points here would be deterministic functions. It would be like, a, so in the case of Bell, so you see that A is the outcome of a given uh, measurement, depending uh, that you measured x equal to zero or x equal to one. So this extremal point here would be basically like with probability one, and it uh, answers zero or one. So, yes, yes. So it's, it's like uh, the deterministic uh, strategies. And here in the uh, quantum case, these would correspond to the boundary of, the, of quantum uh, correlations. So for sure, the pure states are there. But we, as far as I know, we don't know if there is something else. Uh, I mean, 
In the case of uh, Bell, of course, it's going to correspond to uh, pure states because it's convex. So like basically anything that you can generate with a mixed state, it's a convex sum of uh, two pure states. So in this uh, simplest case, yes. But if you go to complicated sets like this, this is not true anymore. So actually, in the quantum case, you could have things here that are not pure. Um, yeah, so that's the thing. Like That's the problem that we want to solve. We want to uh, characterize this set of uh, correlations that are compatible with a given cause structure. And so far, I only focused on classical uh, cause structures because I want to see if there is a classical quantum gap. Okay, so I presented the uh, problem, and now we want to know if uh, machine learning can help us to uh, characterize such complicated sets of correlations. So this is the question that we did like uh, 2017, I think, or 18 when Askeri came, and there were many ways to, to, uh, to do that, and I'm going to tell you like a, a specific way that we decided to uh, approach that it's using supervised learning. Okay, so what's uh, supervised learning? Uh, I told you already, but like uh, basically we have, uh, we want to generate a model, and for that we need some labeled uh, data set. Uh, so in, in the case here, like I'm going to tell you a, a bit more, but basically we need to have some probability distribution, and the label is like telling me if this uh, probability distribution is inside or outside a given set, okay? So that's uh, basically the uh, data that we give to the uh, computer. So this uh, data set, it's divided <coughs> in a train set, in the test set. So this train set, it's what we are going to use to generate the model. And uh, part of this data we use for a cross validation to avoid like a fine tuning of the model. And once we have a model, we can use now to uh, uh, take new uh, points that the machine has never seen before to see how well this model that we generated uh, generalizes. So how well it performs on new points that it has never seen before. So that's the basic idea. So to enter more in, well, I mean, and what we are using here, it's uh, neural networks. Uh, this is what we chose for this uh, specific uh, problem. So I'm not going to enter in many details here, but basically like we have these uh, large networks this, that each, you, you can think of it as a graph. Each node in this graph is like a neuron uh, part. So like you have the input layer that contains this data that you are going to use to generate your model. In between, you have these hidden layers. It, it can have many neurons, many uh, different layers that are going to be activated depending on the uh, data of the bias and like uh, how you are going to train your uh, machine. And in the end of the day, you have the output layer that is going to predict what is the label of a given input. Okay, so I mean, very general. I'm sure that uh, if you have uh, specific uh, questions, Askeri will be happy to, happy to explain to you. He's really the expert. If you have a, a problem that you cannot solve, you should speak to him. Um, so what we use it as the input data? For, it's a long story, but we realized that we didn't uh, know how to give good data. So in this paper here, the first thing we had to do was to uh, find a good way to quantify non-locality, to find a good way to quantify how much is a given data point outside a given set, okay? So uh, let's think of the usual uh, classical set of uh, correlations that it's convex. This uh, light blue here would be like the set of non-signaling uh, correlations that includes the quantum set. Now, if I have a point that it's outside the uh, classical set, I want to quantify the non-locality, the non-classicality of this point by basically measuring the distance of this point to the set of classical correlations. So it's a very natural way to quantify non-classicality. Uh, and what we did here was to propose to use the trace distance. That's basically a measure of distance between two different uh, probability distributions. So what I'm doing here, I'm just computing the trace distance. It's this norm here between the test uh, distribution, this Q, 
and the set of uh, probabilities p that are inside the classical set. So this is a problem that we can write, at least in this uh, specific case, as a um, linear program that we can solve. And even in the case of non-convex sets, we can still write this as a hierarchy of linear programs. And here is where is the uh, problem, that to solve this hierarchy of linear uh, programs takes a long time. Okay, so I'm going to enter in more details, but just to give you the feeling, like if you take the CHSH the, the CH inequality, it's basically the same inequality that we discussed it before, somewhere here, here, but now uh, it's written in a new form. And basically, you can show that this distance of, the, of a given point to the uh, classical set has a linear dependence in this uh, specific case to the CHSH inequality. So the more you violate a given Bell inequality, the more non-classical is your uh, data point. So this seems uh, trivial, but we needed to prove that. So this is what we did in this paper. And now this is what we are going to use as the input data to the uh, machine learning algorithm. So we consider different uh, causal structures, the sets of, of classical uh, correlations compatible with them could be convex, could be non-convex. And now what we did was this. Like for each of these uh, scenarios, we randomly sample over the set of non-signaling distributions. And why we do that? Because sampling over the set of non-signaling distributions, that those distributions that are compatible with, with special uh, relativity is much easier than sampling over the set of quantum correlations. The set of quantum correlations, to this date, it's still un uncharacterized. So it's very hard to sample over this set. I mean, you cannot sample over something that you don't know how it looks, right? So we sample over the non-signaling set. And we take each of these points and we compute its trace distance to the uh, classical set. Okay, so we, and like for this bilocal set, that it's like the case where you have three parties, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, and the correlations uh, between them is mediated by two, um, by two independent sources of state of states. So to sample these, uh, the uh, 100,000 points here and compute its trace distance to this uh, non-convex set here took us, using a good uh, computer, not a supercomputer, but a good uh, computer, one month. So you see, like, it's very costly. It was like one month the computer uh, running, sampling these points and computing the distance of each of these points to this uh, white set here, to this uh, bilocal set. But now, we had the data, and using this data, we trained uh, the neural uh, network. And here, it's like a, this was the idea of uh, Askeri that we, we are going to see is going to improve our results, that it's to use a blending of uh, neural networks. So for each of these uh, data points, we use a different neural uh, networks to make the uh, predictions. And in the end, we make a new neural network that blends, that combines the results of each of these neural networks. And we are going to see that this improved the uh, results. Okay, so 75% uh, of, the, of these 100,000 points that we generated, 75 was used to make the training and cross-validation. And the rest, 25%, uh, was used to uh, test uh, as the test set, so like something that quantifies how well the machine model is generalized. And here are some of the uh, results. So uh, this is for the simple case of Bell, that it's convex. Um, so here we can see like we have 10,000 uh, test set points, so like points that the machine has never seen before. And uh, what we see is that um, the predictions of the machine are quite good. So in blue, like I'm not sure if you can see, but it's here the curve, what we would have for the exact uh, results. And in red is the machine learning uh, prediction, okay? Here, we focus on the set of quantum correlations. So this is very interesting, this graph here, because I'm using a set of uh, correlations that include the quantum correlations, but include something that goes beyond quantum correlations that are compatible with uh, special uh, relativity. And even though I use the large set to train the machine, the performance of the machine learning model on quantum correlations here, I only have quantum points, it's very good. So uh, meaning that the uh, 
machine model uh, really learned how to generalize well, okay? And here is the other feature that we have <coughs> that is called the learning uh, plateau. This is very typical in uh, machine learning uh, pop, uh, pipeline. That it's the fact, so here it's the error in the test set, so like how bad is the machine, the larger is this, the worst is the uh, machine. So, and here is the amount of data points that we use to train the machine. So you see that if you give not enough data points, it's going to generalize not so well. It's going to make a lot of errors in points that the machine has never seen before. But as you increase the data that you use to train the machine, this error decreases, but now it reaches here a plateau, meaning that uh, giving more points to your uh, machine model is not going to improve your uh, model. So this is very important to know where you should stop. And this is important because, uh, as I said before, it took us one month to generate the data points. So like doubling the uh, data points to train the machine would uh, take us two months. So we had to learn where to stop. Okay, so this is very important in base, yeah? What is the L of Q with this function? It's the, uh, it's the distance, this N L of Q is the distance of the point to the, uh, to the classical set that you are testing. Okay, so it has a threshold on the CHS? For, for this case here, for this bit locality case, uh, it, it looks much more complicated. You could, you, you could use the, you, you could basically use any norm. You could use the Euclidean norm. Why we decided to use uh, the trace distance? For many reasons, and one of them is that we, it's easier to uh, compute this than the Euclidean distance. It's faster. You could use, but uh, then we just don't know how to solve this uh, problem here. So what you are saying, yeah, okay, I, I can use the entropy like the uh, kubak liber to compute the distance between this point and this set. I'm not computing the distance between two points. I'm computing the minimal distance between a point and a whole set of points. Oh, okay. And if you try to use the kubak liber I mean, beat my guess, it's very difficult. Yeah. So that's the reason why we are using the uh, trace distance, because it's something that we can compute easy, uh, easily. I mean, if it took one month using this, like if you want to use uh, the kubak liber it would be, so these uh, results, they are exact, because the outcome of a, a linear program is uh, exact. If we would use the uh, kubak liber it would be numerical. Yeah. Yes, may I ask, may I ask uh, which techniques you use? Techniques of machine learning. So you should ask uh, ask Eddie, uh, which techniques of machine learning you use it here? In this uh, in this case, it was just uh, psychic learning, a lot of multilayer perception. Uh, he used the scikit learn that it's this uh, library uh, for multilayer uh, per, uh, perceptrons. Yes, just that. In this case, all that uh, machine learners, it's just multilayer perceptrons with different numbers of neurons and different number of uh, uh, neurons. And we tried uh, 36, if I'm not uh, wrong, 36 uh, different uh, learners. <coughs> um, Rafael. Yeah? Just a short question. Uh, you said that you, it took well, one month to generate the data set. Yes. And then you use that data set to train your machine and so on. Okay. Exactly. And uh, can you use a quantum computer to generate the data set? I mean, could, could we have a, an algorithm to, to do, like Basel sampling? 
Yeah, so I mean, if you, if, if you would be interested in sampling the quantum, uh, quantum correlations, to use a quantum computer would be a good uh, uh, strategy. But we still have the problem that given the sampled point, we have to compute its distance to the uh, set that you are considering, to, to the either like the local or the bilocal or like whatever set. And this is what the, it, it takes more time. It's not really the sampling, but it's computing the distance of the a given point to the set that you are considering. So, I mean, you could improve, but the bottleneck is, the, is computing this uh, distance. And uh, how to compute this, if there is a quantum algorithm that computes this distance in a faster manner, the answer is yes. So there is this uh, algorithm of uh, Fernando Brandão from some years ago that he shows that you have a, a quadratic improvement in SDPs. And basically you can compute, you can understand computing this distance as a sequence of uh, SDPs. So you would have a quad quadratic improvement using a quantum computer. Yes. Okay, so I, I'm not going to enter in the details here, but the uh, thing that I want to highlight here, it's this. It took us one month to generate the data, then maybe a few hours more to generate the um, machine learning model, the machine model. But once we train the machine, we have a black box that we can use now to compute the non-locality, the non-classicality of new points that we have never seen before. And once you have a model, it's basically instantaneous. So we have a 10 to 5 improving time. So now uh, you, you can actually check that. I give you a, a new point. If I would use the, uh, this uh, uh, hierarchy of uh, linear programs, it would, meet, it would take a given time. And now using this uh, machine model, I do have uh, 100,000 improving time. So it's much faster. It took us one month, it took us like a few more hours to train the machine, but after that, we have a black box that we can really use to uh, test the, uh, to quantify the non-locality of new points. And this is very important for uh, many reasons. For example, using this uh, black box, we could find new uh, non-bilocal, new non-classical uh, correlations that were not known in the uh, literature before. And the point here is that, okay, but how can I trust the machine? You don't need to. You use the machine to make a prediction, and now you have a good candidate. Okay, so this uh, correlation here that people before didn't know if it was classical or not, the, my machine model is telling me it's non-classical. What I do now, I use the expensive usual methods to certify that. So I use the uh, machine only as a, as a black box that can speed up uh, finding a good uh, candidates, okay? Um, so how am I with time? 20 minutes more or something? Um, so here, like uh, the machine learning is also very uh, um, certain in uh, finding whether a given uh, point is classical non-classical, like quantum, or even post-quantum. So, I mean, the students of Barbara, I think there are some here, like the students of Rafael Rabelo, for sure they know what I'm talking about. But like, uh, it's a very important question in the, in the foundations of quantum mechanics, trying to understand why quantum theory and not other some generalized uh, uh, probabilistic theory. And this is a very hard question that uh, boils down to characterize what are the borders, uh, what's the border of the set of uh, correlations that we can generate with quantum mechanics. And uh, there are some known analytical uh, questions, and then we just wanted to know if the machine learning model would uh, somehow be useful in this sort of uh, problems. And the answer is yes, and this is uh, expressed here in this that it's called the confusion uh, matrix. So here, it's like the true class, if it's local, if it's quantum or post-quantum, and here is the prediction of the uh, machine. So here in the diagonal are the, um, are the predictions that are correct. So the point was local and the machine said it's local. 
the point uh, was quantum and the machine said it's quantum. The point was post-quantum, something that I cannot generate with quantum mechanics, and the machine said it was post-quantum. And things that are in the off uh, diagonals are the mistakes of the uh, machine. And here, like, the point was quantum, and the machine said it was post-quantum. But you see that the errors, are in comparison with the uh, non-errors, are quite good. Like, uh, so the error, it's quite small. So meaning that we can also uh, trust the predictions of the uh, machine. Again, you don't have to trust the prediction of the machine. The machine is going to make a, a prediction that now you can certify using more expensive methods. That's the, uh, that's the basic idea. Okay, so <coughs> this was the first work, and uh, I mean, this is the good thing. Like, uh, we were in the uh, right place at the right time, because we were the f basically the first ones to uh, try to use machine learning for solving uh, problems in the foundations of physics. But then many other works, they started to uh, uh, come out. And in particular, this one here, it's very interesting. Um, and the idea now is that you don't use supervised learning anymore. The idea is that you take your uh, causal network and you map this causal network to the topology of a neural network. So what I mean with that? So this is the uh, paper from the group in Geneva of uh, Brunet and Gizan. And again, we use this as a tool, and I'm going to tell you uh, now, a tool for analyzing the data that came from a quantum experiment. Okay, so uh, this is the paper, it's in the archive. The experiment was done in the lab of uh, Fabio in uh, Wrong. I'm not going to enter, it's a photonic experiment. Uh, I'm not going to enter in the details here, but basically what they did in this experiment was to implement this causal structure. So they have like three independent sources of uh, quantum states here, and these sources, they are used to generate the correlations between Alice, Bob, and Charlie that are spatially uh, se uh, separated. And the basic question here, it's this, the correlations that were generated in this experiment, they do have a classical explanation or not? Or can I really say that the data in this experiment is quantum? And what we used was the uh, results of this paper, of this uh, theory paper that basically tell me, well, if I do have a classical model that can explain the data, meaning that it's compatible with this causal structure, it should exist a neural network that mimics the topology of this causal network able to generate the data. So what this means? That I have an input now, I'm, I'm just going to sample here like some random uh, classical variable. This is going to uh, be used as input to three independent neural networks, and this independence of the neural networks is mimicking the independence of the sources in the experiment. And now, for each of these uh, neural networks, I'm going to use them to give a certain output for uh, the outcome of Alice, the outcome of Bob, and the outcome of Charlie. And the point is, so uh, this is this uh, basic uh, uh, te uh, theorem in machine learning um, that g tells you that if you have a deep enough neural network, you should be able to reproduce any function. So if there is a classical model, there should exist some neural network that gives me what I observe in my experiment. Okay, so now what we did, uh, we generated the data and we computed the distance or we computed like what is the minimum distance of what we can generate with this, uh, with this neural network to the data that we actually generated. And if the point is non-classical, this distance should be positive. If I can generate a distribution that reproduces what I, can gen what I generated in the uh, experiment, this would mean that this experiment was classical. But if this distance is larger than zero, it means that I, I'm non-classical. Uh, it's the basic idea as here, right? We are just computing this uh, distance here, but now using uh, machine learning. Yeah, and then what we observe it, so here it's, uh, well, we, g we generate in the experiment like uh, what's called the Fritz distribution. Uh, this is uh, the theoretical description using uh, 
machine learning. It's this uh, orange curve. And here, it's what we generated experimentally. So basically, what we did was that we were adding noise to the experiment to see where this distance would be equal to zero. So what this is telling us is that with half noise, we have a point that it's quite far from the classical set. But as expected, as we add noise, we get something that it's easier to, simula to simulate uh, classically. And at some point here, this uh, experiment becomes classical because we added too much noise to the experiment, OK? Right, so until now, <coughs> we only talked about uh, classical networks. I'm asking, OK, I have a quantum experiment. Can I explain it with a classical network? But now we can try to uh, ask the quantum version of this. I have some data. Is this data compatible with a given quantum causal network? And what is a quantum causal network? It's basically like instead of having random variables here now, I assume that the uh, correlations between the nodes in the network are mediated by quantum states, OK? Um, so this is something that we have worked a lot, like uh, developing uh, methods to characterize quantum networks. So I mean. Classical networks are hard. Quantum networks are even harder for a number of uh, reasons. So we have some uh, analytical tools these days to uh, characterize the set of uh, correlations that they can have in a given uh, quantum network. Of course, we are not the only one doing that. So uh, the group in uh, had a very uh, important paper last year about that. OK, so the question now is, can we use machine quantum machine learning in this case to characterize quantum networks. And the idea here, it's really uh, the same that I gave to you before. It's to map the topology of a quantum causal network to the topology of a quantum circuit or a quantum neural network. OK, so that's the basic uh, idea. We were very excited about it, uh, but then we were scooped by this paper here, so I'm, I'm not going to tell our own results, just like uh, the basic idea of this very nice paper that came out, I think, this year. OK, so before getting there, uh, I'm going to tell you like a little bit about uh, the variational quantum circuits, that it's something that it's very important when we talk about quantum machine learning. I think Kaskeri, in his uh, course about quantum finance, is basically going to be using KAOA, that it's one uh, sort of uh, variational quantum circuit. But the idea is the following. Like uh, in a variational quantum circuit, like you have some uh, uh, gates that are going to prepare some, um, some initial quantum states. Then they are going to evolve according to some uh, unitaries that act like in blocks of uh, qubits here of your circuit. And this circuit, he, it has like uh, parameters that can be changed. It could be like if you have a uh, uh, to rotation, you are going to change the angle of this uh, to rotation. If you have a entangling gate, you can uh, change the entangling power of this uh, gate. So you have some uh, parameters that are free and that you can tune, okay? So how you do that? You have this, you randomly choose some initial values here for your um, quantum gates. Then you measure these guys, you make some average, and now you use a classical uh, machine learning, like some classical optimizer, to change the values of these uh, parameters of your quantum circuit. So this is what we call a hybrid uh, classical quantum algorithm. Because the hard part that it's like to generate the model, the quantum neural network, this uh, parameterized circuit, you do in a, in a quantum computer. But the optimization process, like using uh, stochastic gradient descent or whatever you want to use, it's done using a, a classical algorithm. And why we do that? Well, because we should give to the quantum computer only, only the things that are really hard and what we can do uh, easily or efficiently in a classical computer, well, we should use it, right? So that's the basic uh, idea. <coughs> and uh, in, so in these uh, variational algorithms, like basically, you are going to encode the solution uh, to your problem in a given operator O. So this operator O, for us, uh, for example, could be the, uh, a given Bell inequality. Could be like a given Bell inequality that I want to maximize. 
I want to ask what is the uh, optimal or the maximum violation of a given Bell inequality uh, by quantum mechanics. So this O here encodes the uh, problem that we want to optimize, the function that we want to optimize. This O could be, I don't know, the um, ground state of some Hamiltonian. Okay, so this O is some operator that encodes the objective function that we want to optimize. And we have a family of states that depend on uh, parameters P1 to PK. So it's the family of states that we can generate with a given circuit. And of course, that uh, the number of uh, tunable parameters should be much smaller than the dimension of the Hilbert space. You don't want to search in an exponentially large space, right? So you should find a good parameterization of, your, of the states that you are going to generate with a given quantum circuit. And how you do that in practice? It's very similar to what you do in uh, neural networks. If you have a single, uh, a single layer in a neural network, the uh, set of functions that you can generate is going to be much smaller than the set you can generate if you increase the number of layers. So the idea here, it's the same. You start with a single layer. Okay, it, it didn't work. Then you add a second layer, you add a, a, thir a third layer. In the limit, in the asymptotic limit of infinite, infinitely many layers, you are basically going to, to recover the dimension of the Hilbert space. But the hope is that you can stop before, right? Um, and yeah, so it's, uh, it's this hybrid uh, framework. So the operator and the state psi that can be generated in a given circuit, they are produced in the quantum device, but the parameters P the, uh, that can be tuned in this uh, quantum computer, they are optimized in a classical computer. So you have this uh, feedback, right? The uh, quantum computer is generating classical data that it's fed in the classical computer, and the classical computer generates data that is going to update the uh, parameters of the quantum computer. Okay, so then we can basically use the same idea that we used uh, before. Here, I have some uh, complicated uh, quantum uh, causal network where I have now sources of entangled states, these sources, they can uh, be suffering some uh, channel here, some noise, before they are measured in uh, these uh, blue stations here, like Alice 1, Bob, and Alice 2. And the basic idea is this, is that you map the topology of this quantum network to the topology of a circuit. So I do have two independent sources of states. So this means that in my quantum circuit, I should have two independent uh, sources of states here, like the unitaries that act on my input uh, qubits, they should not be global, they should factorize. So you see, the independence of the sources is being mapped into the independence of the unitaries that are acting in the circuit. And, by, and like now, I can add uh, this noise here, I, I have some measurement uh, devices, I measure them, I get some data, I use a classical computer to tune these uh, parameters that change here what I'm doing. And doing that, in this paper, they show that you can, um, you can use this quantum optimizer to characterize the set of uh, quantum correlations, okay? So here, it's really a quantum machine learning. I'm using a quantum algorithm that, in principle, it's running in a quantum computer. Of course, that in this paper, they use uh, sim uh, sim sim Simulators. They uh, simulate these uh, quantum circuits into a classical computer. If you are not in Google or in, uh, in PAN's group, I mean, you, you don't have access to good quantum computers, so that's what we can do, right? We have to, sim to, to simulate things. Of course, we could use like IBM quantum computer or something like this, but unless you are willing to pay, what you are going to generate out of these uh, quantum computers, it's like uh, white noise. So yeah, really, like uh, we, we try it. It's a very good generator of uh, white noise. It works really well. Um, okay, so this is it for um, the characterization of uh, causal networks. Uh, if you give me 10 more minutes, I think I can uh, present you the other problem that we have here, that it's the characterization of quantum phase uh, transitions. I'm not a condensed matter uh, uh, physicist, 
But in 2017, it was the year that Toscadi uh, came there, like this exploded. Like people, like it was in the cover of uh, nature physics, in science, nature, like people using a classical machine learning to characterize uh, the properties of uh, complicated Hamiltonians. So like basically the uh, kind of problems that they were solving here, they were basically showing that uh, using uh, convolution neural networks, different kinds of uh, neural networks, they could uh, characterize the different phases that you have in a, in a given uh, Hamiltonian system. <coughs> so uh, Askeri was good with, with uh, machine learning. I was working on quantum information. I had no I idea of uh, Hamiltonians, but on the side of my uh, office, there is uh, Rodrigo Pereira, who is the expert on uh, complicated uh, Hamiltonians. Then we just knocked at his door and said, give us some complicated Hamiltonian. Then he thought a little bit, and he came back to us with this uh, Hamiltonian here. I mean, it's the simplest of the uh, hardest Hamiltonians that you can think of. So call it the a a actual next nearest neighbor Ising, an I, or I don't know how to pronounce that. So it, it's basically easy. You have the uh, nearest neighbors interactions between uh, the spins like, uh, yeah, that are neighbors in your uh, network. And you have the transversal field with some uh, weight here, G, on the X uh, direction. So these two, if you only have these two terms, this is the IZ model that you can uh, solve analytically. So you can find the uh, phase diagram of this guy. But then you add this extra term here where you add some interaction between uh, next nearest uh, neighbors. So the uh, spin in position one is interacting with three, in position two it's also interacting with four, and so on. And adding this... Uh, a uh, simple guy here makes the uh, model much more complicated. You, you cannot solve analytically, so don't ask me what kind of uh, tools they ask they uh, use here to. Uh, so here is the phase uh, diagram. So here it would be the parameter uh, g, and here it would be the parameter k. And actually, there are many other uh, phases here, but the three basic phases that uh, appear when you put these uh, extra terms. So you have a ferromagnetic phase where the spins are always pointing in the same direction. You have the paramagnetic one where like they are disordered and you have the antiphase where you have these blocks of uh, orientations. Okay, so this was the problem. Like uh, in, in order to give these boundaries here between these three different phases that appear in the Hamiltonian, this was what uh, Rodrigo told us. It's hard, you need to like, uh, you, you have to diagonalize this guy, so you need to uh, co uh, consider like a, a, a given number n of spins, but you cannot go very far. Then you, you can use these uh, DFT uh, techniques. I mean, you, you have different uh, methods to find these different phases. You need to find the uh, order parameter and the sort of things that we learned there in statistical physics, but it's hard. Okay, so it's hard. We solved hard problems before using uh, machine learning, so can we use machine learning here? And as we did before, I'm going to tell you the classical version, and now we are working on the quantum version. And for our surprise, the quantum version is even better than the classical version. Okay, so what we are using as data? Uh, we are using as data what people typically use to, f to find some other order parameter and, and see what, where you have this uh, transition between phases. So basically, we consider 8, 10, and 12 sites. This is the big N, the number of spins. So you see, this is uh, ridiculous, but it's what we can do in a, in a classical computer. So I don't know how long it took, but I was again using like a very good uh, computer. And basically what we did was to compute uh, for this different number of uh, spins, the correlators along the X, Y, and Z uh, direction between all pairs of spins, okay? This is what people typically use to uh, analyze the phase you are in, as, as you would vary these, uh, these uh, parameters here, K, K and J. Okay, so uh, the first thing we tried, and it worked really well, uh, was to use unsupervised learning. So basically, we have this uh, raw data, that is, it's this uh, correlator, so like, uh, 84, 135, and 198 uh, features, like these uh, correlators. 
and we are giving this to the uh, computer without telling the computer anything. We are saying, look, we have these different data points. It's like, so let's say that we are with uh, 12 sites. So we have a vector with 198 features, like entries in this vector, and we are giving many of these vectors to the computer. And we are saying, look, these vectors, they are different. Find me why. It's, it's, it's hard, right? Look, lots of vectors, lots of entries, uh, to real numbers varying between minus one and one. Tell me why, I mean, not why they are different, but tell me which ones are different from which ones. So that's the basic idea of uh, unsupervised learning, right? I have some unlabeled uh, data set, and the machine does some magic, creates a model that it's able to cluster these uh, different data points into different sets. So here is the first uh, problem. If I give you a Hamiltonian, but I don't know how many uh, phases this Hamiltonian has, because this is one, this is one important thing. You, you, don't, you give unlabeled data set, but you have to tell the machine the number of clusters that you have there. Okay, I have two, uh, separating uh, white or black. I have three, white, black, and green. So you have to tell, in principle, the machine how many clusters you have. But nowadays, and we do this in the paper, actually you can uh, even optimize the number of uh, clusters, okay? So we do a lot of things there, but I'm going to tell you what we did uh, fixing the number of uh, clusters. So we said to the machine, we have three. Just find where these uh, transitions are happening. Again, we are giving a bunch of uh, vectors with uh, 198 features. This is what we are giving the machine. And what the machine gives us back, it's this. Yeah? Is this a training machine? What? Is this a training machine? Um, I mean, it's, un it's unsupervised. So uh, yeah, this is like the model that the, date that the machine will generate to that input data. I'm, I'm I don't have, sorry, I... You never trained this machine before? No. In this case, no. I, I, I'm going to show you another example of uh, transfer learning where we have here, we don't have anything. It's like out of zero. We are just giving the data to this, uh, uh, what's the algorithm here? But KNN, it's uh, supervised, yeah, no? Supervised. But, but this is the unsupervised version. But, but you can also do unsupervised with KNN. OK. Um, so when we saw this, we were really surprised. I mean, in black, it's uh, the uh, numerical, analytical, uh, I mean, condensed matter people who did this black curve, and the white and, uh, I know, Sorry, the blue and the uh, orange, it's what you get out of the condensed matter uh, techniques. And the black is what the unsupervised algorithm is giving us back. So look, the machine ha has no idea what is this data. We are just telling. There are three phases there, and this is what we are getting back. Yes. No, in, in, in this case, we are telling it's three. Oh, okay. You're right. Yeah, we are, set, we are telling it's three because we are only looking at these uh, three phases here, and then it, it's this that the machine gives us back. In the paper, we, we also uh, um, make the analysis with four and five, then the results are not so good. But, but like these other uh, phases that appear, you really need to use like uh, things that go beyond the order parameter. So it's not surprising that the machine cannot find. So, so like basically, uh, what the machine couldn't find with this data, it's, uh, it's what is here. Like these, these other phases that I don't remember the name, but it's described there in the paper. Um, yeah, the machine doesn't predict well. 
Um, yeah, uh, so here, let me just uh, spend three minutes here because uh, it's what we are going to do quantum next. That it's what we call uh, transfer learning. So now the idea is to uh, train the machine in simple instances. So let's say uh, you do supervised learning now. I have some labeled uh, data now. Like uh, for some reason, like this uh, input data, it's easy to compute, uh, let's say, in which phase it is. So I can give this to the uh, machine. And now I ask if this model that I generate in a simple instance generalizes well to hard instances. And this is exactly what we are doing here with this. Uh, now we use uh, su supervised learning for k equal to zero. Because if I make k equal to zero, this is just Eisen. So I can, I, I have an analytical solution to this uh, Hamiltonian, to the ground state and the phases. So we train the machine using supervised learning for k equal to zero. So basically we are uh, changing here along the g uh, parameter. And we create a model for k equal to zero. And now with this model, we ask the machine to uh, find the phases <coughs> when k is different of zero. And as you see here, like some uh, methods, they work really bad. But uh, in particular, the, key, the KNN, that I'm going to speak uh, uh, in more details now, works quite well. So he can predict quite well the uh, phases for the region where the machine was not trained for. I'm trained for k equal to zero. And, and now I'm asking to make predictions for k different of zero. OK, so uh, what is this KNN? I have a bunch of uh, labeled uh, data, in our case, like only for k equal to zero. And now I, so like these data points, they could be uh, light blue, uh, purple, or blue. And now I give a new point, and I want to know in which of these clusters it's going to fall, OK? And how I do that? I first have to decide how many k neighbors I want to use in my uh, prediction. So let's say that I use k equal to 3. Then basically uh, what the algorithm does is to compute the distance of this new point to its k uh, closest uh, neighbors to make an average and choose the one that is uh, the closest. So in this case here, k equal to 3. Uh, it's going to tell that this uh, white point is actually purple. But you see that if I, could in, if I would change a different K, the uh, results, they could be different. And how you choose K, it's a bit, uh, I mean, it's a bit like art. You have to, to have a good choice. And of course, I can use different uh, distances. I can use the uh, Euclidean distance. I could use uh, kubai kleiber I could use the Hamming distance. That it, like if I have a bit string, it's, it's, it's basically going to tell me like at which positions my bits are different. If it's 0 and 0, the, or 1 and 1, the Hamming distance is 0. And if it's 0 and 1, the Hamming distance is, is 1. And I do this for the whole uh, bit string, and this is going to give me the Hamming distance. So this is uh, this KNN. It's very easy to implement and adapt because you have very few parameters. But it's what we call a lazy algorithm. Because it's not really g generating a model. It's basically like every time you have a new point that you want to classify as uh, green, uh, purple, or blue, it ha you have to run the whole thing again. Okay? And you see that the larger is k, the more complicated is going to be the algorithm. Uh, but it doesn't create a model. It's not, it, it's not that it's telling, ah, the properties of the green points are these, of the uh, purple is this, and the blue is this. No. It's basically every time you have a new point, you have to run the algorithm again and compute these uh, distances. But in, in practice, it works well. OK, so just to tell you about the quantum version, and I'm really finishing. I don't want to keep you away from the uh, weekend. Um, let me just tell you like something that it's, uh, it's the basis of like uh, quantum machine learning, that it's how you encode information. And we have different ways. The first one is what we call basis encoding. So let's say I, I have a bunch of data, like could, could be these two vectors here. So like this would be my data point one, data point two. And each of these data points have two features, like uh, these uh, real numbers here. 
And the point is that now with this basis encoding, we represent real numbers as binary numbers. First, we have to make a binarization of these uh, real numbers, and then we transform them into a quantum state in the computational basis. Hence, one bit of classical information is represented by one qubit. So it's a very expensive encoding. But it's very expensive, in the same time, it's very uh, broad and general. So uh, first, the bi uh, binarization. So the number uh, zero, so let's say that each of these numbers I want to encode into five bits. So the first bit, it's basically telling me if the number is positive or negative. So if it's negative, it's one. If it's positive, it's zero. And the other four numbers are basically encoding uh, the, the digit that I have here. So if it's one, it's zero, 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 one. If it's four, it's zero, zero, uh, one, one, and so on. Okay, so I'm just binarizing the, uh, these uh, real numbers. And now, I take these binary uh, vectors here and I transform them into a quantum, into a quantum state. Okay, so if I have that uh, 10 bits, I will have 10 qubits. And typically, uh, what you do is that you have to generate, so you, you, you have a bunch of uh, data points, like could uh, represent these points here in this uh, space. I'm going to binarize them to create the, uh, the vectors, the uh, state vectors, and now the first step in any quantum machine learning algorithm is to generate an equal superposition of these uh, input data points, okay? So in this case, is the I only have two data points, so I have two uh, superposition of two uh, state vectors. Generating this here is a bottleneck. It could be v like a, in this case, I don't know if it's hard or not, but if I have a generic uh, uh, superposition of states in the uh, binary, uh, in the computational basis, it could be exponentially hard to generate these uh, input states. So this is really a bottleneck of uh, quantum machine learning because you don't know a priori how expensive it will be to generate this that it's the input to your quantum circuit. Okay, so this is basis encoding, and then we have amplitude encoding. And amplitude encoding, it's nice, it's, its main advantage is that you only need uh, a number of qubits that goes as log of nm, where n is the number of uh, features of each uh, input data, and m is the number of input vectors I have, okay? And why is that? Because basically, I'm going to encode the real numbers now into the amplitudes of a quantum state, okay? so. I reduce a lot the size of the uh, of the uh, of the input state that I have to generate. But generating these states can be even harder than generating these ones here, because now not only I, I have to make a superposition, but in this case the uh, superposition it's with equal amplitudes. In these cases, in this case here of amplitude encoding. Um, these amplitudes could be anything. So it's, in general, much harder. But, but, but you save quite a lot, like you have an exponential uh, saving on the number of qubits that you need. Okay, so uh, using these uh, different encodings, like there were many papers that were generalizing the, key, the KNN, this uh, classical algorithm to the quantum case. So this is the only part that uh, I, I have uh, equations, but uh, I will skip it. If you, if you are interested, uh, we can talk later. So yeah, it's a very simple algorithm that basically uh, it's able to compute the Hamming distance between a new instance and the uh, instances that uh, were there before. And as it happens with any um, quantum algorithm, it's uh, probabilistic in the sense that like uh, it's going to uh, classify the cluster where this new point is with a certain uh, probability, and this probability is larger, the smaller is the Hamming distance of these points. So what I'm trying to say is this, like uh, let's say that these are quantum uh, points. Basically, I'm going to compute the Hamming, like what this KN, the quantum version is going to do. It's going to uh, make a parallel uh, co uh, computation where it's going to compute the Hamming distance between this new instance and all the other points. So this is already an uh, advantage of the quantum algorithm. That uh, k, it's equal to n, where n is the number of uh, 
data points because it parallelizes this, uh, this uh, computation of distances. But then, like, it, it basically is going to compute the distance between um, this new instance and now the given points. And now you are going to measure uh, ancilla state. And uh, the smaller is the distance between this input state and the, um, and the uh, known data points, the higher is the probability that you are going to find the ancilla saying that you are in a given class. So it's uh, probabilistic. There is a chance that you are going to make a mistake. But if you run the algorithm a few times, you make this uh, probability as, as small as you wish, OK? So this is really important. Like, uh, I mean, uh, in practice, many people use this. And, and, and there are different uh, variations between these different uh, proposals, but the basic idea is the same. Some use amplitude encoding. Some use this uh, basis encoding. Some use other uh, more uh, refined encodings. But the basic idea is, is the same. It's like, OK, I'm going to compute these distances and take the one that it's closest to my uh, new instance. OK, so we used that <coughs> for the problem that we had before. So in blue is the classical version. It's the predictions of the classical version. So like in uh, black, it's the uh, known results for this uh, NI8 model. Here in blue is the predictions of the classical algorithm. And in red is the uh, predictions of the quantum algorithm. So in particular, you see that this uh, turning point here, the quantum version uh, makes a better prediction than the uh, classical one. And I mean, of course, you, you can uh, introduce measures here to uh, qu quantify which model is better. And by doing that, we can prove that the uh, quantum algorithm uh, works better. So, I mean, the distance of the quantum predictions to the actual uh, analytical solution, or not really analytical, but the uh, standard solution, it's, it's uh, smaller if you use a quantum uh, algorithm rather than the classical one. Of course, we are not using a quantum computer here. We are simulating a quantum computer in our classical computers. If you use uh, IBM, it's probably going to be, I don't know, a constant line here because it's a white noise. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a proof of principle. It's just telling, look, there is the hope that with a good quantum computer, you would have improvements in, the, uh, in classifying the phases in a complicated Hamiltonians. OK, so uh, this is what we learned. And I just want to mention here that uh, this is something that I, I think it's quite uh, promising in, on the level of like a proof of principle to really show that um, once we have better quantum computers, not necessarily like a, a fault tolerant or with error correction, but with like uh, errors that are a bit smaller, we actually have the rope to solve uh, real problems. And what we are trying now, it's really like uh, to make the proof of principle in some applications. So there is one project that it's in collaboration with ISIS. Uh, she's from the comp computer science department in uh, UFPE. And they work with uh, data that comes from uh, this EEG, like this electroencephalogram. Like they basically put these uh, things in the head of people, and they get data out, and they use uh, machine learning to try to predict uh, properties of this uh, time series. And in the project that we have now, like this uh, EEG data, is used to predict the uh, drowsiness of a person. So the idea is that this person has, is like operating a heavy machine. Uh, and if it sleeps, like it's going to kill all its uh, colleagues, so it should not sleep. And then you have this, uh, this uh, machine in the head that it's reading the signals from the brain. And if it predicts that the person is, become, is like going to sleep, like it, it, uh, it plays a horn. And then the person is awake. Everyone is happy. And then they uh, use this data uh, with uh, classical machine learning. And they have a given accuracy. And then what we are uh, wondering, uh, so the paper should, should be out um, 
soon, soon meaning between one month and two years, but uh, uh, we already have very good uh, results that show us that uh, these uh, variational quantum circuits, they improve the accuracy as compared with classical algorithms. Again, it's a simulation. We are not running in an in a actual quantum computer, but it's a proof of principle. I mean, in terms of time, I'm not really sure what's the uh, time comparison. We, we didn't do that yet. But in terms of accuracy, it's better. And the accuracy is not much better, maybe 2%, but 2% might be the difference between your colleagues uh, leaving or not, right? So, I mean, it's, it's good anyway. Uh, so I'm not going to enter in details here, but we also did that for uh, problems in finance, in particular for uh, portfolio optimization. And there we don't know if there is any advantage in accuracy or uh, running time. So uh, Askeri is going to, to talk about that next week in details, but the basic idea is that it works. So at least we get the right answers using quantum computers. If you have advantages, we don't know. And in general, so this is like the uh, pet project with uh, Askeris. Like, uh, yeah, Picanha is really expensive, so we are trying to make some money out of this. And it's really like uh, using uh, quantum algorithms to uh, make a forecast of uh, time series. So this is, it's not going to be published, because if it works, we want to write, uh, use that. But uh, what Askeri is doing is like to use these algorithms to try to predict whether to buy or to sell uh, bitcoins. So like you have different kinds of, the, of bitcoins. So I, I think he's focusing on Ethereum, that it seems to, to be the one that these codes are working better. I mean, I, I think he even put some real money. I, I, I hope we didn't lose, but I don't know. Uh, but yeah, so, so like uh, really there are many applications, real uh, problems, it's everything heuristic. There is no a priori proof that you are going to have any advantage in um, accuracy, in uh, running time or anything like that. It's basically like uh, as with uh, machine learning, it's a kind of a black box that you have to uh, analyze case by case and try to see if you have any potential advantage or not. And this is also like the, uh, let's say, the baseline of the startup we have. Like, this is very difficult. Like, people come, ah, yeah, we want to solve this problem using quantum computers. We say, look, there are no quantum computers. Like, uh, what we can do is to analyze your uh, problem, make a, a study case, and try to give you a report saying, look, it, you might have the hope that you have some improvements using uh, quantum algorithms when, the, uh, when some better machines are out. And I mean, this is something that uh, people outside Brazil, I think they understand well. In Brazil, no. I mean, it's very hard to speak to, uh, speak to business people here because no. I mean, what, why should I invest on something that will not give me a return now? Um, but yeah, like uh, it's... Uh, it's at this level, it's a proof of principle. It's uh, studying the cases where we really might have uh, the hope to have uh, some improvement. So yeah, um, I think I'm more or less on time. Thanks for your attention and yeah, if you have any questions now or later, I'm still going to be here, so thanks. <laughs> sure. Yes, I would like to 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 ask like, uh, one more time. Um, uh, well, about those phases, you know, because uh, well, I just wanted to know if you want to also look into these other phases, because uh, well, I was reading that uh, yes, there are like five phases, right? And uh, they have different uh, like uh, well well correlators like uh, if you take like well sigma x um, um, in a, in one side, and then. Uh, yeah, anyway, can you just, just go back, like, uh, I think it's like two more slides. Yes, this one. Yeah, so you are taking a look at uh, 
like so for example when you say like sigma x i and uh, j so you are taking all of these correlators for every distance right yes mm -hmm. i see yeah i just don't understand like uh, like uh, well well why you don't see other phases maybe that's because you have a like uh, well, only twelve sites. Maybe if you had more, you would see. Or yeah. So if you if you go to these uh, to the papers that uh, analyze this uh, model uh, to see these other phases, they typically have to either go to very large uh, <coughs> uh, spin numbers. Like uh, then they use these uh, DFT and this kind and this kind of things, uh, or you really need to go to use. Uh, data that it's not really only uh, x and x. You could look for x and y between different sites, or you need to use uh, correlators uh, that are not pairwise. You might need uh, multipartite uh, correlators. So it's more complicated. So uh, from what I understand of the problem, using this specific data, this is uh, these uh, three phases. It's what we could expect to uh, recover. In, in any case, in the paper, we do analyze uh, these other phases, and it, fi it finds like qualitatively okay, these other, uh, so we go up to five phases, mm -hmm. but then it's not as good as here. It's just saying, look, I'm, I'm putting some line here, but it yeah. doesn't mean anything. I see, I see. Okay, thanks. <coughs> More questions? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I'm curious about those uh, post-quantum correlations. Could you talk about what yeah, are them? Um, yeah, I'm very happy to talk about them. Uh, I spent a big part of my life thinking about this post-quantum correlation. So, um, yeah, like just to try to give you the um, big uh, picture. If you think about uh, uh, relativity, you, you, you have like non-usual uh, predictions like time dilation and these sort of things. But all of that comes from kind of very f physical, simple uh, principles. The speed of light is the same in every reference frame. I mean, it's something that everyone can understand. But now in quantum, uh, you have like even weirder predictions, and those come from a very uh, a weird uh, mathematical postulates that are the postulates of uh, quantum mechanics. That you describe things uh, by a Hilbert space, but, and then you have the uh, measurement postulate that brings a lot of problems. So, um, why quantum theory? Like, can so from one side, can we uh, have better, more intuitive uh, ways of understanding these uh, postulates? Can it be that we actually have a kind of more physical description of why uh, these postulates or why the consequences of uh, quantum theory? Something that we have special uh, uh, relativity. And from the other side, so if you go to uh, so let's say that we know nothing about quantum mechanics, and for some reason someone did a Bell experiment, and then saw that you have a violation of a, a certain number. Then the person would, would try, would, well, okay, so my word cannot be classical, what it is. Because a, a Bell experiment actually tells you nothing about quantum theory. It only tells you that nature is not classical. It's, it's not telling you that it's quantum. Then you, you could think of, well, okay, so I have a violation of a Bell inequality. What's the underlying theory that uh, describes that? And let's say that the Bell experiment would be uh, made in 1910. So uh, before quantum theory, um, or like the real quantum theory, but after like uh, the paper of Einstein about special Relativity. So a theorist would say, well, okay, we should use a theory that it's compatible with special relativity. And what this person doing the calculations would find is that nature, if it was only described by special relativity, would, would allow to reach a value of the CHSH inequality equal to four. But then the person would do experiments and more experiments and never pass two square root of two. So there is a gap 
between what uh, Einstein would tell it's possible and what you actually observe in the experiment. And why there is this gap? So everything that it's beyond two square root of two, it's like this uh, set here, uh, where, where it is? It's post-quantum. So here it's the boundary of quantum, and in green would be like what is allowed by special relativity. So why we don't have something here? And uh, this is a very hard question. We have very good uh, answers now. We do know how to characterize these, uh, these boundaries of quantum, or at least part, part of them, uh, using things that are more uh, intuitive or that we can understand better than just the uh, postulates. So, for example, one of these principles, it's called the uh, information causality. That it's basically telling you that, like, uh, if I send you um, one bit of information, you should not have access to more than one bit of information. It, it, it seems weird, but post-quantum uh, correlations violate that. So they are compatible with special uh, relativity, but they violate this uh, information causality. And you have other uh, principles. There are many out there. None of them are known to really to recover the quantum boundary. But I mean, why quantum correlations? Now we can say more than simply, than simply saying, ah, because uh, I have the four postulates of quantum mechanics, and that's it can say, well, because uh, if you would go beyond quantum mechanics, I would, using one bit, I could send actually like a, many bits of information. So it's not the full answer, but it's a bit more intuitive than just like a bunch of uh, mathematical statements about a, a complex uh, vectorial space. So yeah, that's, that's the, and there are many other things that if, you would have access to these uh, post-quantum uh, correlations you would be able to do. And they seem so unlikely that we can take those as sort of uh, uh, postulates to why quantum theory and not something else. And I mean, there are uh, some nice, uh, so I mean, th this is my personal view. Like we are not going to see anything post-quantum in simple causes structures like, like, like those. We've tested these like uh, ad nauseum, and of course, we, it's everything uh, compatible with uh, quantum theory. But who knows about quantum very large and complex uh, networks? So that's my personal, one of my personal reasons to really look to things beyond Bell. Because who knows? Quantum mechanics might, might fail for these uh, more complicated things. I don't know, like if you ask me, the chance is 99.99 .99 that we will not fail, but we, maybe, who knows, yeah. So it's, it's, very, uh, it's, it's, it's very foundational, like uh, really trying to go, we have no reason to go beyond, but we know how to go beyond quantum mechanics and make things that are actually like testable. You, you can go to the lab and test whether the predictions match or not. So it's nice. I have a related Hi. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And I have actually two questions that are related to the machine learning model. Uh, the ratio for the training and the testing data, why 75% 25? Ask it, why 75? <laughs> Is there a particular reason for that? or And is there a relationship between this ratio and the plateau that Rafael showed us? No, the uh, plateau, it's only for the training set. Oh, only for the training yeah. set, OK. okay. Yeah, it's just, uh, just the usual. Standard. Like, yeah. But it's also because I lowered a, a little bit because it was taking too long. So oh, OK. <laughs> so in general, people use 8% uh, and Eight and, to N. And eight it depends N. on the kind of data set. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if it's a kind of simple data set, so you, you can pass a lot of train data so that you improve your cross validation, mm -hmm. so that you don't need to finish training everything and then go to the test set and, and see if it's really good. You mm -hmm. can do this in the cross validation. But I just decreased because it was taking too long. I, okay. uh, I remember that. <laughs> okay, and the other one, probably is for you too. 
um, when choosing uh, which part of the data set will be for training and for testing. How do you do that? Um, I was reading some, something related to using Bozo sampling to do that, to generate random numbers, to really randomly choose the data set which was going to be to training and to testing. Have you ever thought about that? In this case, uh, we just checked if it was representative. Okay. So uh, we look at the distribution, the train set, and the distribution in the test set, and then uh, we check it's okay. And uh, what we did, and it's a good practice, is to stratify. For example, if you give uh, the same percentage of uh, zero and ones in the train set, you give the same percentage in the test set. It's right. a good way to go. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so thank you, very nice presentation. And I was thinking to myself that uh, uh, today, these days, the, the work of uh, like Max Tegmark and their work with building machine, machine learning techniques to uh, come up with symbolic uh, expressions for certain physical systems, only with video, only with raw di data, is really um, is, is getting nice results, right? So. And I was thinking this, that uh, since you, now you have uh, a good network to test if it's uh, a quantum system or a post-quantum system, and you said that most of the boundaries on your set are not, uh, you don't have the whole boundary, right? You have some, maybe some regions. <coughs> and ha have you thought of um, using uh, these kinds of symbolic regression techniques to come up with inequalities that would give you boundaries for uh, your set? Um, no, we thought of ways of uh, trying to recover uh, these boundaries expressed as uh, inequalities. In the end of the day, this is what you would like to have. Um, we tried different things but not uh, these techniques that you mentioned. So what we tried that kind of works, more or less, I mean, at, at least in practice, was <laughs> just a fitting. So we said, okay, like, uh, let's try to fit this data with a polynomial of order n, and then you, you have a gigantic inequality, but, I mean, full of noise, but at least you have some, uh, an objective function that now you can optimize. Um, and this worked, like, uh, for example, to find these new uh, correlations. So what we did in the end of the day was this, like to get some very noisy uh, description of this boundary, and then now use this noisy description to find new candidate points that were not known before. But then, okay, the machine predicts that, now you go back to your expensive, uh, comp your computational expensive techniques, and you certify that this new point from the machine was non-classical or not. And actually, uh, this is what you, this is in this graph here. Like this noisy description of the uh, machine is this gray thing here, and in uh, blue is the exact. So you see that uh, it's a kind of offset there. So it's, it's really giving a blurred uh, description of the boundary. But it worked to, to find uh, new non-classical points that were not known before. I mean, when you talk about machine learning, it's this. Like, uh, you should not trace, uh, trust the machine. You should always have some way to certify that actually what the machine is telling you is uh, correct. But yeah, so this is a very important thing to be able to recover these boundaries. And with machine learning, at least what we tried, it doesn't work. Apart from this blurred uh, description. So it could be that these other techniques would work better. Yeah, as I said, I thought it would be um, testable, you know, if you had an ex exact expression, like yes. really symbolic expression, right? Yeah. We, we have uh, ways of getting these uh, symbolic expressions. Uh, so like the best way it's using a technique called the uh, inflation but yeah i mean we can it's yeah. it's more technical but uh, yeah. yeah from the quantum inflation one from the perimeter uh, or, or the paper? classical yeah oh okay 
They okay. also have the classical inflation and the quantum inflation. Okay, thank you. Uh, I watched a video by Sabine Rosenfelder uh, where she, she kind of criticizes Bell's conclusion that uh, a local hidden variable theory would not reproduce the, the results of quantum mechanics. She argues that uh, we should consider the possibility of not obeying statistical independence. And she calls that super determinism. But after watching the video and researching a bit about, I, I don't think I un quite understand what, what is super determinism, uh, what yeah, are so, implications. I mean, I work a lot on this and uh, I mean, for me this makes no sense. I mean, it makes sense, but it's so, Unlikely that, uh, so basically in a Bell experiment, like if you draw it as a deck, so here it's the choice of Alice, here is the choice, it's the outcome of Alice, then you have the choice of Bob, the outcome B of Bob, and you have some source here that could be a quantum state. I mean, if you are testing for Bell, it should be a classical random variable. So this is the causal structure that you impose your, in your experiment. And the assumption here, so like uh, the locality assumption, if you really believe uh, special uh, relativity, like you are in two uh, space-like separated uh, regions, so you should not have arrows from one side to, to the other. So like uh, one possible way of uh, violating locality would like uh, some arrow like this, where like whatever um, Alice is choosing to measure in her own lab might have some causal influence over Bob, even if he's on the other side of the uh, universe. By the way, this is how you explain the violation of a Bell inequality in Bohm's theory. It's a, it's a non-local hidden variable model. It's everything deterministic and so on, but you have these non-local effects, okay? So this is one way. And uh, I mean, at least I don't like it. Uh, and the other way that you can, so this is one causal assumption, the locality one. The other one is uh, I call measurement independence, she calls a statistical independence, that it's basically saying that there might be some common cause between the choices of the observers of which uh, property to measure, and the uh, quantum system that is being uh, prepared. And I mean, this could be the Big Bang. In principle, everything has a common cause, right? Uh, there is no way that you can exclude that. But I mean, if you, if you allow for this sort of uh, explanations, then it makes no sense to do, so. I mean, she, she goes against that, but for me, that's it. If you really don't believe that you can choose which property of a system to measure independently of how that system has been prepared because of the Big Bang, everything is uh, correlated and super deterministic or whatever. It makes no sense, I mean, how can I be sure that the property, like the temperature that I'm measuring of a given system is actually not the, is actually the temperature because now if I would decide to measure some, something else, the system would have changed. So I mean, this correlations between uh, measurement uh, choices and the system that is being prepared to be measured, is there a, a way to exclude that? S yeah, so we have a, a, a paper, also with Fasciti, but it's no machine learning, where we give a partial answer for that, and yes, we can test at least partially the uh, this measurement dependence. So, this was uh, the result of my uh, pandemic. Uh, so I, 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 I'm, I'm very happy about that. But yeah, so we can discuss that. So there are, in principle, ways. But you cannot really exclude. I mean, it's something that uh, it's not testable. So if it's an assumption, with this assumption, you can explain everything. I mean, with, uh, so let me try to give another example. So. Let's say that it's like these games, I'm sure that here in Sao Paulo you, you, you might have that, like it's the uh, three uh, cups and, you, and I put a ball under it. And then the guy will make this and you have to find where it is. So let's say I can say which uh, cup I'm going to uh, uncover 
is my measurement choice. So if I have three, I have three measurement choices. I can take one, two, or three. But now let's say that how the system has been prepared, meaning under which of these, uh, of these uh, cups the ball is, is related to my choice of which cup I'm going to uncover. This means, like, uh, if, every, if uh, <coughs> statistical independence, if measurement independence holds true, it means that uh, with uh, probability one-third, I'm going to find the ball, right? At random, like one-third of, of the times, I'm going to make the uh, correct choice. But if I violate measurement independence, I might never find the ball. Why? Because the ball, it's under a, a given cup, but if, so let's say, if it's under uh, the uh, cup one, this model here would say that if it's under cup one, I should never be able to open the cup one. So there is some hidden mechanism in nature that if the ball is under cup one, I'm forbidden to take a cup one. This is what these arrows here are telling me. I mean, she wants to trust this is the, the explanation to Bell. Okay, it's untestable. No free will. No, yeah, like a free will, it's a more philosophical way at looking at it. I mean, you, you, you don't need to talk about freedom of choice. It's really just a causal assumption that we assume that uh, these errors are not present. So yeah, you, if you ask me what's Bell's theorem, it's just saying that uh, realism doesn't exist, that you should not speak about the properties of a uh, quantum system unless you uh, actually tell me what is the experiment that you are going to uh, make to probe that quantum system. So it's like, uh, I think it's Asher Paris who said, right, that uh, uh, unrealized uh, experiments have no results. So yeah, that's for me what, I mean, but you, you have three options that you have to give up. Realism, uh, locality, and measurement independence. Like Sabine would say it's measurement independence. Uh, Toft also would say it's measurement in independence. Uh, Bomians would say it's the locality. Uh, yeah, so Copenhagen's would say it's the realism assumption. You have some freedom there. But actually, like, uh, this freedom is uh, reducing with time. I'm not sure that we are ever going to pinpoint out what is failing might be a combination of all these things, but yeah, up to now it's, uh, you might choose what you like most. But, but you should give up at least one of these things, yes. Thank you. Well, last question, or not? If this is not the case, let's thanks again. <coughs>